As we're continuing our study through here, Hosea uh, is uh, handing out some indictments and some sentencing. In the last uh, couple of chapters there, seven is the, is the indictment, uh, eight is the uh, sentencing, uh, what is going to be happening. Uh, we can cross-reference this with Deuteronomy chapters 27, 28, and 29, and also 30 with some other stuff there about the, the blessings and the uh, curses. Uh, if you uh, do that which is right, Israel, as you're going to the promised land, if you do that which is right, uh, things are going to go really, really well for you. God really, really, really wants to prosper them. He really wants to take care of them. They need to go in. And if you're taking notes here, he wants them to drive out. He wants to, Garash, it's in the Hebrew, he wants them to drive out the inhabitants of that land. We know that promised land is that land. It's not the land that they're going to get rest. It's not uh, a picture of heaven. It's a picture of this life and the spiritual battle that we have. Uh, you are to go in and you are to root out sin and you are to get rid of those um, uh, people. And again, if you're reading the Old Testament, you think, man, there's just a lot of killing. It seems like uh, Old Testament gods, a lot of vengeance and stuff. Well, uh, you read about the people. You read about the inhabitants and the nations of those peoples and, the, and just the things that they were into and that they did and the destruction and death, and, and you'd want them uh, to be taken care of. I mean, no one here would have a real problem with, uh, say, a Ted Bundy or a Charles Manson or uh, some type of mass murder of something. You're like, oh, well, if there was a whole nation of those, well, yeah, I think they should go. Uh, we wouldn't have a problem with that. So when you read the and people say well there's a lot of killing there's a lot of, there's not a whole lot of grace a lot of vengeance and stuff well that just means they're biblically illiterate and i don't mean ignorant they're just biblically illiterate to to the to the people once you under describe all those things once you uh, explain them what they were all about well do you want them living in your neighborhood do you want them there uh those are the things that go on there and so i was just talking with someone uh, today uh one part of town uh, uh down West 7th Street there, saying, you know, the guy was complaining, there's 23 halfway homes there. And then all the connotations of that go or with the halfway homes. That's a really bad area. There's, and just in that few block area, there's 23 halfway homes and all the people that are be there from, from uh, sexual offenders to drugs to alcohol to all the other things in between and the maladies there. And they're just thinking, they're, they're all there. They're all there. And, well, all of, everyone's all for rehabilitation, someone getting right, you know, being on the straight and narrow, but not in my neighborhood. Not in my neighborhood. Uh, we've seen the same thing that happens with uh, uh, a woman who was put in an orphanage. She was trying to start a modern-day orphanage. And uh, everyone thought it was great, but not in Eden Prairie, not in Shakopee, not in Chanhassen, not Minnetonka. But it's a good idea. It's a good idea. And then where are we going to go? Well, where is it going to happen? Where are we going to go with that? What are we going to do? But, yeah, we're all for that idea, but not in my neighborhood. Just, you know, somewhere else. It's got to go somewhere else. I like Sheriff Joe Apayo, who uh, in, uh, in uh, Arizona, in Phoenix, in, uh, uh, that uh, he has, he has, his crime really goes down because he puts everyone, he houses them by law in tent cities. Uh, the inmates have to wear pink underwear and pink clothing. Uh, he has to feed them, so he gives them bologna sandwiches. Um, they were complaining about fighting over the cable television that was in the, in the jail. So he said, not a problem. Now he's the only cable station. And he reads bedtime stories to them uh, at night. Uh, and uh, some um, news reporters were uh, from Minnesota were going out and interviewing Minnesotans who were in jail at Tent City in Arizona. Bad jail conditions. No air conditioning. Living out of the tents. And you're interviewing people, and they said, you know what? I can't wait till I'm getting out of here, because I'm leaving Arizona. I'm going back to Minnesota. It's easier there. Crime's easier there. Their jails are better there. And you're just going, okay, see, Sheriff Joe Apaya, his idea is working. People are leaving Arizona, but people are saying, well, that's just horrible. The way look, he's treating Minnesotans. These Minnesotans are now going to come back to Minnesota and do their crimes here, because the jails are a lot friendlier. And they have heat and all those kind of things. You understand? Not, not in my neighborhood. So when you go through the Old Testament, someone does these things about, well, go through and study the Amalekites and the Hittites and the Gergesites, all the Uptites and Otisites and all those. And you read their history, what they're really about. And you're like, oh, yeah, I don't, I don't want that around. They also represented sin, and you were to root out the land. Well, here in Hosea, 
the northern kingdom, the ten northern tribes, or geographical locations of the ten northern tribes, the people who migrated from the south because they wanted to be more immoral, those who were doing righteousness, who wanted to stay more true to uh, the temple and, and real worship, migrated to the south uh, for those who could. And now there's a great prosperity that's happening in the northern kingdom. And remember the thinking and the mindset. Well, we're prospering. Things are going really well here. God must be honoring these things, but yet they're into all types of idolatry. An idol gets in the way between your relationship between you and God. This idol, this thing that you're worshiping, this thing that you're bowing down to, this thing that you're... And listen, you say, well, we really don't have these idols. That's voodoo. That's juju. That's all that uh, crazy stuff. A little, no, 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 no. That thing that you're giving your affection to, that thing that you are giving your attention to, your time, your talent, your treasure, your being, that thing that possesses you, that thing you're obsessing about, that's an idol. They just had physical figurines of what they were about. Some people have idols. They have keychains with their idols on them. They have all the various other things about that that would say that's, that's the thing that you're spending an inordinate amount of time towards that. So here in chapter 9... He tells them here, do not rejoice, do not rejoice, uh, O Israel, uh, uh, do not rejoice with joy like other peoples. For you have played the harlot against your God, you have made love for hire on every threshing floor. The threshing floor and the wine presses shall not fe uh, feed them, and the new wine shall uh, fail in her. The threshing floor where they're supposed to be threshing out the grain, where they get those things. In other words, they're saying by their own hands, by their own prosperity, they're, they're prospering by their own hands. But you've prostituted yourself out. You, you have, again, you look at the word picture there, you have uh, fornicated, you have made love, you've done all these things on the threshing floors, and, that which, and you're saying that it's by your own hands. I and mean, they're going to fail you. Uh, they shall not dwell in the Lord's land, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt and shall eat unclean things in Assyria. They shall not offer uh, wine offerings to the Lord, nor shall their sacrifices be pleasing to Him. It shall be like the bread of mourners to them. All who eat it shall be defiled, for their bread shall be for their own life. It shall not come into the house of the Lord. You're giving yourself over to this. Now again, they're going to be taken into captivity. The northern kingdom is going to be assembled or assimilated by Assyria. But those, they're also, remember, they, they try to contract with the Egyptians to fight against the Assyrians as well. And they tried to contract with the Assyrians and everybody else. And they basically were just conquered by those other peoples. But Assyria was the main threat and who took them into captivity. And you're going to eat all these unclean things. <clears throat> you're going to do all these things that you're saying that you're not doing right now, but you're going to be defiled by these things. Verse 5 of chapter 9. What will you do in the appointed day and in the day of the feast of the Lord? For indeed they are gone because of destruction." Egypt shall gather them up, uh, uh, Memphis shall bury them, nettles shall possess their valuables of silver, thorns shall be in their tents. You're not going to be able to do that. You're, you have that opportunity right now to go to to go to the center, or, uh, to go to temple, to to go into worship, to go to your house of prayer. You you have that opportunity right now, but it's going to be gone from you. You're going into judgment. Now, a hundred years later, Judah is going to be uh, overtaken by the Babylonians. And they should be listening and seeing what's going on with the northern kingdom. But they had pride in themselves, as we're going to see here in the later chapters, is that they said, well, we've got the temple. God's obviously not going to let Jerusalem fall. And they have their little lucky charm, the, the temple there. So, well, they, that, that's the northern kingdom. That's, those are those rebellious people. And so here they could be learning from others. But again, for indeed they are gone because of destruction. Look at verse 7. The days of punishment have come. The days of recompense have come. Israel knows. The prophet is a fool. The spiritual man is insane because of the greatness of your iniquity and great enmity. The watchman of Ephraim is with my God, but the prophet is a fowler snare in all his ways. Enmity in the house of his God. They are deeply corrupted as in the days of Gibeah. He will remember their iniquity. He will punish their sins. 
Remember, some men's sins go before them, which are evident, and some men's sins come after them, which will be obvious and evident to all. And again, in the last couple of chapters, it's like, oh, God forgot about our sins. He forgot about that little indiscretion. He forgot about that little thing. He says, no, 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 you've never repented of it. You never got those things right. You're going to have to deal with this. And that is the, the relationship that God has. And it's all relational, folks. It's all that He wants in this relationship. You can't go and do these things and, and not talk about these things that are going around. We, we have terminology. We say, well, it's the white elephant in the room or it's the 800-pound gorilla or whatever. It's the, it's the thing that you need to talk about and you need to go ahead and talk about those things. But you need to deal with those things. But many of Christians will, again, avoid it, stuff it, not deal with it. And then they'll crash, they'll fall in upon that rock, or they won't be upon that rock and be broken, but that rock will fall upon them and they'll be smashed. They'll come back and get restored, and they'll start growing with the Lord again, and then God will bring them right back to that point. You've got to deal with this right here. You've got to deal with it. You're just not going to get away from it. And it's not that God's being mean. It's not that He's being torturous. It's because you need to get past that, because there's some other things you need to deal with. I mean, if you would have told me 29 years ago all the sin I would be giving up, all the things I would be dealing with in my life, I just thought it was just drugs and alcohol. I just thought it was just, you know, immorality. I just thought it was a little fornication here and there. No, man, those are easy. Those are easy to take care of, man. I remember years later just praying and said, Lord, I just, why can't I just be like our, 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 our church drunk? I mean, the guy just, you know, he'd walk with the Lord, get drunk, and... And then every couple of weeks, he'd be sober for a while. And he was just, that guy was just happy just being in that little baby cradle of Jesus. And, and that's all he And I would think, well, that's a miserable life. But I remember saying, you know, I'd just rather just deal with the drugs and the alcohol. But those really weren't the issues. Those were the symptoms. Because I wasn't dealing with the other stuff. Psycho babblers and the recovery movement and the various other things like that will tell you that, well, you know, you've got to deal with this chemical dependency and stuff like that. Hey, look, I'm Greek and Irish. I come from a long line of criminals and drunks. And my gene pools maybe not be the best to work with. But here's understand this. I wasn't born a drunk. Some people would say in the recovery movement or type thing or addictions and like that, well, you're, you're predisposed to that. Look, I had to consume mass quantities for a considerable period of time before becoming chemically dependent upon that. But you can handcuff me to any pole and I'll be dry in 30 days. The issues, what were those things that were driving me? Well, first I was addicted. I liked the lifestyle. It looked cool. But after a while, you're no longer addicted to the lifestyle. You're just addicted to the drugs, and then you don't really want to share anymore. You just, you'd rather get stoned by yourself or drink by yourself or do those things by yourself. It's cheaper. And you know you're hooked up and you're caught up in all those things. Well, here, God is going to make you deal with those things. Why? Because he loves you and I. He loves us so much that we have to deal with those things. And, and there will be other successes and, and then failures and things, but then that thing's going to... And how do I know? Because early on in my Christian experience, early on, just a couple weeks in the Lord, praying for a, a, a father who left when I was nine months old, and I saw him do other things. I saw him shoot people. I know people that he's killed. And, and I, I, you know, a little kid, I could care less about that. I just wanted daddy. Always blaming him for things in my life that I didn't go around if I just would have had a dad in my life and all that kind of stuff. And... and when I became a Christian, just having one of those Holy Spirit times of just praying, and you're praying and praying, and you don't realize you're praying for hours, and every, every, every so often the thought would come in to pray for my dad, and, oh, no, he's going to burn in hell. And then I'd go back to start praying for other things, and a little while later, just a thought would be just to pray for your dad, love him, pray, ah, no, no, no. I can tell you the first real miracle in my life, because that first week in my life I wasn't dealing with the drugs and alcohol, I was waiting to go through DTs, but the first real recorded miracle I can count in my life is that I actually felt love for a father who abandoned me. So much so that after a few hours of just praying, didn't understand, crying, and I run and I go call him collect from overseas and ask him to forgive me for the things that I've done to him. And he'd been waiting to reconcile with me. He didn't know how to ask. And that really is the first thing that I remember as, as a brand new baby Christian within my first week of the Lord. It was just like, wow, I really got to get... And, and that's the thing that's every, everything else. I, I wouldn't have been able to move on after that or until that is dealt with. God loves us enough that you're going to have to deal with those things. And so here it tells us the days of punishment have come. The days of recompense have come. Israel knows. Here's the other thing. You know. No one could ever come to me and say, well, I didn't know. You know. <laughs> I know you know. Just because you don't want to say it, just because you haven't said it, but you just know there's something there. There's something icky. You know there's something going on. And you can try to hide it. You can try to deny it. You can try to cover it with all these other works. You can try to overcompensate all the various other things. But you know. You know, early on in ministry and, and just serving the Lord, and I really believed people. Like, oh, you, don't, you didn't know? 
But I know. Well, it says right here. So like that. As I've grown in the Lord, I realize, oh, we all know. We, we, we know. And someone might come to me and say, hey, Pastor, I want to tell you about my life. And I go, hey, I, I already know you. Well, you don't know anything about me. I, I know you. There's nothing, there's nothing new under the sun. And they're just like, I was at a pastor's gathering and and uh, it was just going on. There was a lot of these pastors. There was probably about 20 of us, and we're trying to get to know one another. And we've only got a few hours. And the guy says, well, why don't you just stand up, give a, give a short testimony, and uh, where are you teaching it in the Bible in your church and a, and a prayer need? And, and uh, it started with the A's and the B's, and he gets the check, and I'm probably about the fifth guy in, and it's already taken an hour now for the first four guys. And I just got up there with a bunch of other Calvary Chapel pastors and said, hey, born in 62, started getting stoned when I was 8, dropped out of school when uh, I was 15, drunk, drunk and alcoholic by the time I was 15, all kinds of stuff, rob, kill, steal, destroy, joined the Marine Corps, got saved when I was 19, uh, walking with the Lord, raised up in ministry, and uh, sent out here to start a church, and we're in the book of Romans, and uh, we need chairs because uh, we we're growing. Uh, amen. There's 20 passengers and their spouses, and they're all like, ah! I mean, because you guys follow the testimony, right? You can fill in all the other blanks. I know you. You know me. That's just it. I just, I don't, I, you can just do all this stuff. And they're all like, wow. Well, the next guy got up, gave probably about a two-minute testimony. About three guys in it, we're back to 20-minute testimonies. And I would just sit there, I really don't need to know that. Been there, done that, you know? And then that was the thing that we were talking about. We, we kind of crack up with some of the other pastors. Look, we're not going to hold the fact that you have a high school diploma against you. You're okay. All right? We understand you have higher education. You finished. Uh, we're okay with that. And all of it, so the thing is, I, I know you. So we know. We know these things. And let me, hear your, let me hear your story about how it came about to it. But it tells us here that the prophet is this fool now. And he's insane. The priests are supposed to represent the people to God and the prophet for the God to the people. And the prophets, they're just running around crazy. And they're telling them there's peace and prosperity. There's all these great things. And the Assyrians are coming. And they're saying, but look, God really must be here because their theology. See, if you get in this presupposition, or if you get in this perception of how God's supposed to operate all the time, well, then you can really get tripped up there. Because you think, well, that's just the way it's just got to be. God really must be okay. And, and he's not. He's not going to co co-sign sin. It tells us here in verse 10, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first fruits of the fig tree in its uh, first season. But they went to Baal Peor. Now, this whole thing back in verse 9, this Gibeah. If you remember the children of Israel uh, coming out, I believe it was in Deuteronomy uh, 20, or Numbers 25, that they, uh, what happened in Gibeah? They mingled with the Moabite foxes, right? The, the women there. Balaam, the prophet, saying, hey, look, you need to, you know, you can, uh, you can get over there. And you, you can't really, uh, I can't really curse them. I can't bring a, a curse upon them, but you can get God to go after them. What do I do? Well, then you, you get your women down there and you get them to intermingle and marry and, and do all those things. And then they'll start, they'll get their hearts away from the true God. And they'll start worshiping and sacrificing uh, towards their gods because the women are going to induce them with sex and all these things. And the guy's like, yeah, that's exactly what happened. He tells us, this is what's happening. You, you, you're intermingled. You're dealing with stuff. You've, you've prostituted yourself. You have these gifts and callings that God has given you, and you've prostituted yourself. And now you're on the threshing floor. You're doing these things. You're saying it's by your hand and by your own genius here. And it's just like Gibeah. He says, I found Israel in verse 10 like these grapes, like these in the wilderness. It was going to sustain you. It's sort of like that oasis. You're in the middle of the wilderness here, and there's these grapes here. They're going to sustain you and do these things. And you're like, ah, oh, this is good. That's how God first viewed them. And, it, and, and so he tells them here, I saw you in this first season, but they went to Baal Peor and separated themselves to that shame. Numbers 25.3. They became an abomination uh, like the thing they loved. Their hearts were all for the immorality. They really, oh, really want to do those things. And they intermingled in all these things. And you go back into Numbers and you, and you see these things here to their shame. They became an abomination. So again, Balaam couldn't curse them, couldn't pronounce a curse upon them, but he got God to go after them. It tells here in verse 11, As Ephraim, uh, as for Ephraim, their glory shall fly away like a bird. No birth, no pregnancy, and no conception. Uh, through 
Uh, Though they bring up their children, yet I will bereave them to the last man. Yes, woe to them when I depart from them. Just as I saw Ephraim like Tyre planted in a pleasant place, so Ephraim will bring out uh, his children to the murderer. Give them, O Lord, what you will give. Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breasts. Um, So you're literally going to die out. You saw, maybe you've seen a video I've shown here about the population and how it will cease to be the America and some of the other countries that they don't repopulate. They don't, they have to have a sustained growth of 2.11 and, and how Germany and lots of Europe, they're, 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 they're just about beyond recovery. Uh, and so in about 50 years, uh, America, less than 50 years, America will be beyond recovery. Uh, we're at 2.8. We need a 2.11 a birth rate. And what's happening? Well, abortion's really taken over. And uh, so people aren't reproducing that way. People are having smaller families and um, uh, those things. And so God's not going to allow them to continue on. And they're literally going to be a slow death. They're going to die out because they're not going to be reproducing. And so, but here's the thing. They went after immorality. They went after the Asherahs, the Baals. They went after all this infertility. And they would start going after and saying, well, we, you know, now we need these lucky charms or whatever. And, and Asherah and everything. And God's just going to dry them up. God's going to allow that to happen in their lives. Give them, O Lord, what you will give. Give them a miscarrying womb and a dry breast. All their wickedness is in Gilgal. For there I hated them because of the evil of their deeds. I drove them from my house. I love. I will love them no more. All their princes are rebellious. Ephraim is stricken. Their root is dried up. They shall bear no fruit. Yes, uh, Yes, were they were to, they were to bear children? Were they to bear children? I would kill uh, the darlings of their womb. Verse seventeen: My God will cast them away because they did not listen. They did not obey Him, and they shall be wanderers among the nations. Well, we know they are. We know in seventy A.D. with the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, they've been wandering around for again. They have no temple. They have no place of sacrifice. Again, we read earlier in this chapter here that they had no place, they couldn't do their offerings, they couldn't do their sacrifices, they can't. Remember what Leviticus says in 11.17, without the remission of blood, without the, the bledding of blood, there is no remission of sins. The life is in the blood, and there has to be a letting of blood for their, and there has to be these sacrifices, and they're not sacrificing to this day. They are still wandering around nations. God is bringing them back, as the prophecy says. Right now, 112 countries, Jews from 112 countries comprise the nation of Israel. Well, when I started going to Israel back in 97, it was about 105 countries. But now they have 112 countries, Jews from 112 countries. But they're still wandering. And there's no place for sacrifice. But understand this word here um, in uh, verse 15. I will drive them from my house. That word drive is garash, garash, like ganashing of teeth. Now, it says that God drove, except a few places in Genesis where God drove them out of the Garden of Eden. God drove out uh, Cain, and, and you had to go because you killed your brother Abel. But pretty much throughout the Old Testament, and when they were supposed to be coming into the Promised Land, this word right here, see, it's a very poignant word. We only have one word or one phrase for the words drive out. What is that in English? You see, now to the Hebrews, this garage, this word right here, is the word that God used to give them to drive out the inhabitants in the Promised Land. And now God has reversed it. And He says, now I'm going to drive you out. Wait a minute. I'm, I, we were supposed to be driving them out. We're supposed to be the ones doing that. And now God's going to drive us out. What a reversal of fortune. But what was, what was the indictment? What was the reason why? My God will cast them away because they did not obey Him. If you're taking notes, He says He desires obedience over sacrifice. A lot of people can be very sacrificial. It can be very sacrificial and very fulfilling to be a philanthropist or to, uh, to just give and give and give and give and you can get that accolades and that praise from people and you can give with the wrong motives or, and people can go ooh and ah. We've seen Jesus talk about that. Uh, especially when they were given money at the temple. But God desires obedience over sacrifice. Reoccurring theme over and over again. And here's verse 17. But wait a minute. They were prosperous. 
They had things going on. Even though the Assyrians were rising and coming to power and stuff like that, they were still thriving. They still had a thriving economy. Things were happening. And what did they do? They gave, when you read through Numbers and when you read through First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings, and you read what's going on, they're accrediting it to these false gods. They're accrediting it to their great and wonderful skills. And they're skilled craftsmen, skilled artisans, skilled everything, but they were giving credit to themselves. Thus, they were making love and doing stuff on the threshing floors, and they were doing those things that, that again, by their own hands, by their own wisdom, by their own super wily coyote, super genius ideas and thoughts. So that by their own hands, well, that therefore then they become their own God. Have you ever talked to anybody and they say, well, I think God is a lot like, and really they're just describing themselves. He says, well, that God sounds a lot like you. Kind of does, doesn't it? Well, you're your own God. Well, if I was God, thankful it's not, thankful or not, but, and, and, and he said, well, I don't think God would do that. I don't think God would send anyone to hell. God doesn't. There won't be one person in hell that God has sent. You know, he sent the angels, those fallen angels that he's kept in torment there, but not one person God will send to hell. We go to hell, not we, you maybe, but uh, others go to hell because they end up there because they choose to be there. Well, who would choose to be there? Precisely. What in hell do you want? What, what is there that you want that you would choose to go there and to do that? But yet that is their choice. But God doesn't send anyone there. Why? Because look, my God will cast them away because they did not obey Him and they shall be wanderers among the nations. You know, we had a book written by a brother here in the church, you know, save, uh, Sam, son of a man, a saved soul and a wasted life. And that's, that's, that's a lot of things that's happening in the body of Christ today and in churches. People haven't saved souls and just wasted lives. I mean, because of our original mom and dad, Adam and Eve, we're going to work by the sweat of our brow. Uh, we're going to produce. The ground's going to have thorns and thistles, and we've got to plow, and we've got to do these things up. And, and we do go to work. But your sum total existence is not to go to work and pay taxes to the man. Your soul to, uh, exists. Without, that's, your, that's your avocation. Uh, that's what you have to do so you can do your vocation, servant of the Lord. Just whatever it takes to, so I can get this other gig going there. And, and here, uh, because of a lack of obedience. They had all these other things. And again, on the outward appearance, it looked like everything was together. But look at chapter 10, verse 1. Now, it starts off here, Israel empties uh, his vine. He brings forth fruit for himself according to the multitude of his fruit. Now, again, it alludes to it in chapter 9, but in chapter 10, it just comes out and says it. You think by your own hand. But look at verse 16 of chapter 9. Ephraim is stricken, their root is dried up. They shall bear no fruit. Talking about that, that root, I mean, the vine can be broken, a branch can be broken, but really the problem is when that root is destroyed, you're really not going to have much growth anymore. And now this is what he's talking about. He says, look, that, that root is dried up. He's talking about here the offspring as well, but you're going to dry out. That, that, that's what you really... Again, Solomon tells us that what gets in and ruins the vineyard. Those little foxes, they get in and they... What do they do? They, they chew at the, at the base, at the root. The vine still seems to keep growing, and it looks prosperous, it looks lush, it looks like great vines and great grapes, but yet they don't know that they're dead and they're dying because, they, again, they cut off the source there. And so here he says, Israel empties his vine. He brings forth fruit for himself according to the multitude of his fruit. He has increased the altars according to the bounty of his hands. We're going to see hypocritical formalism here. They have embellished his sacred pillars. Their heart is divided. Now they are held guilty. He will break down their altars. He will ruin their sacred pillars. Look, This isn't for church on Sundays and Thursdays, especially Thursdays. These aren't sermonettes for Christianettes. You know, when I say, are you taking notes or these doing these things? This is our philosophy of ministry here to reach, teach, men and send. And Ephesians chapter 4, it talks about equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. 
And th there doesn't need to be a show of hands because it will show in your lives. But last week, and for those of a couple of you, I emailed this too. We'll get this on the website. But what about these 11 points? What about these things that I discussed last week about about making decisions. Because look, Israel emptied themselves. They said by their own hands, by their own fruit of their own hands, uh, everything they've done here. When it comes to making decisions, did, did, it, did it strike to your heart at all? Did you ever say to yourself, uh, again, point one, first acknowledge that our methods, ways will fail. God desires humility of heart concerning our own abilities. Again, this is a biblical decision-making suggested approach. These 11 things. And again, I can email these things. But did any of this take root? Did any, did, did any of it this week say, you know what, I'm going to base some decisions. And maybe just some of these points here. I'm going to go to these. Or, or, or as again, as it says here, verse, no, uh, verse 9, uh, point 9 is what a lot of people jump to. After all the above, 1 through 8, have been done, then look for any indication of God's will and circumstantial events of His providence. Most Christians make this the first and only step, which is then interpreted only in the light of the desires at that moment. But that's what the world says. Well, it feels good, do it. If you can't love the one you want, love the one you're with. That's all emotions. That's all feelings. And, and here's these points. Uh, point two, acknowledge our need of Christ's authority and power in everything that is to be blessed of God. Point three, pray continually and earnestly for God's direction and Christ's preeminence and all that is planned and done as you search for His will. And again, all the very scripture references that I have with this. Point four, carefully seek to discover if any biblical principle is or are violated by the contemplated decision. Point five, discover the special commands. So the, discover what special commands apply to the, uh, the contemplated decision. Point six, seek out the counsel of godly men for help with the, with the above as well as general advice. Point seven, do not undertake the decision if your conscience is troubled, even if you don't know the reason why at the time. If this principle is violated, the end result is seldom a happy one since this is the ordained means God uses to warn us when we do not see an issue clearly enough to make a decision on objective, on objective grounds. Point eight, remember not to make your decisions on the basis of the experience of others. It is absolutely impossible for you to know all the hidden variables that entered into their circumstances and decisions. This is not meant to invalidate the counsel of parents and others in authority, but to avoid the trap of assuming that others' experiences are suitable model for your decisions. Uh, I already gave you in point nine, point ten. Do not make serious decisions when angry, fatigued, full of pride, or discouraged. Decisions so undertaken are nearly always regretted. And number eleven, remember that God can and does overrule even our sins and errors for good if we have truly sought to serve Him and to obey His word throughout the process. Now that's instruction that was given last week, and you just have to ask yourself in the spiritual inventory and just like, well. Uh, did I do any of that? Well, maybe I wasn't here last week. Well, it's online. Are you in tune and in vision of what's going on here and what God is dealing with Calvary Chapel St. Paul? You have an experience that others won't have on the online because they're just going to get the academics. But the things is, is that right now for each and part of our lives here, if not, and here's my warning as a, as a pastor, as a fellow Christian, when I've transgressed or I've gone against these things. I stand before you today, as like I said last week, i got three broken ribs and a bad back because of disobedience. People keep asking, well, what happened? How'd you break your ribs? Just disobedience. Many Christians who know about disobedience go, enough said. I don't, want, I don't care about the details. That, that was the issue. Others are like, well, what? What happened? What happened? Just disobedience, man. Somewhere I shouldn't have been. Straight up. And so I understand that. But he wants obedience over sacrifice. And so here's the thing is, is that if these things are transgressed, if this thing is not habitual in your life, I'm telling you as a fellow Christian, I'm telling you someone who's 29 years, has gone on 29 years of being a Christian, someone who's been pastoring, someone I've seen it, there is nothing new under the sun, then you cannot help but be verses 1 and 2. We're, because if you're not seeking God in His wisdom... If you're just looking at the circumstances, well, then your theology or your perception will be, well, I just, I just, I, you know, you might as well just read tea leaves or something. Because it's in light of the desires that you have at that point. 
Israel empties his vine. He brings forth fruit for himself. What are we to be about? Others. Jesus Christ said of himself, I came to minister, not to be ministered unto. Man, the whole purpose of why you work and go and do and pay taxes and mortgages and stuff like that, so you, you can have that and do that, but our lives are to be based in others. If we... Because understand what has to suffer here. If you invest your life into others, you really won't have time for your problems. you got to make a decision. I want to save some personal time for my problems. I need my alone time. I need to take my ball and go home. Uh, but when you develop and you are investing your lives into the lives of others and, and ministering and the service, that's why I'm always about giving people jobs. Just give you something to do. Keep you busy and stuff like that. Why? Because you're going to focus way too much on yourselves. And you're going to be distracted about many, many things here. You'll bring forth fruit for yourself, and there'll be a hypocritical formalism. You'll look good on the outside. But look at verse 2. Their heart is divided. Now they are held guilty. He will break down their altars. He will ruin their sacred pillars. Those things that you hold sacred, the few things that you hold dear, those things that, that you think that are important to God. And I would encourage you about getting involved in the lives of others. I am not, not calloused, but I am privileged that I have seen about 400 people go into eternity. And the majority of them, not believers. The majority of them, not believers. And I have a view of eternal life, what's happening right there, and I have never seen anyone wish they spent more time in the office. I've never seen anyone just say, everyone. And again, the example I use, even the famous actor Michael Douglas right now, who's cancer, what is he saying? I, really, I, I realize now I wasn't that great of a father, and I should have spent more time with my first family. He's remarried, and I've got these other kids, and I'm just going to try to go for it on that one there. It's why oftentimes the youngest child in the family is the most spoiled. Why? Because after you go through three or four kids, you realize, eh, sorry. And then you just try to make everything right on the last one. And then you go overboard on the last one. Not with us. We're equally poor with all the kids, so they didn't get anything. But understand this. That's stereotypical than the other things there. But I am experiencing that with being a grandparent now. I understand. I get to fix everything on that one. I get to focus all that stuff on that one. But understand this, folks. The heart is divided. James tells us, what is that about a double-minded man? Unstable in what? Some of his ways? All. Not some. Not sort of. If you're double-minded, you will be unstable in all your ways. You literally will not be able to make a decision. And I try to teach guys here, and I try to teach, just make a decision and commit to it. Well, what if it's wrong? Then you're going to get some experience. And then you're going to be able to make right decisions. Oh. Do you understand why I'm very good and very successful right now? I made a lot of bad decisions. There's a whole bunch of people who aren't even around anymore that <laughs> you guys are like the little child now, the last one. Right? You, you get the best right now. Learned a lot of things out there. But here's the thing, a heart that's divided. And you know the interesting thing about deception? It's very deceitful. You don't know you're being deceived. That's the thing about deception. And Jeremiah 17, 9 tells us that the heart is wicked and deceitful and desperately sick. It's actually beyond cure. Who can know it but the Lord? This is what's happening. Remember, in the last couple of chapters, they were involved in all these types of things. And Hosea says, but you don't even recognize. You don't even know it. You, do, you, don't, you don't even know what's going on there. Tells us here, verse 3, For now they say, We have no king, because we did not fear the Lord. And as for the king, what would uh, he do for us? They have spoken words, swearing falsely and making a covenant. This judgment springs up like a hemlock in the furrows of the field. That's poison, folks. The inhabitants of Samaria fear because of the call of Beth Avon. That's that house of iniquity there. Uh, for its people mourn, for if, uh, its priests shriek, uh, for it because its glory has departed from it. The idol also 
shall be carried to Assyria. As a present for King Jerob, there in Assyria, Ephraim shall receive shame, and Israel shall be ashamed of his own counsel. I mean, the things, that a life of regrets, the things that I'm ashamed of, the things that I wish I wouldn't have said or done or, or have done those things here. And that very idol that you're trusting, it's going to be carried away as well. You're going to lose it all. That's why Jesus says, he who seeks to, to save his life is going to lose it. But he who loses his life shall find it. We come after him. That, that you can't hold on to it. My favorite quote is of Jim Elliot. Writes in his journal. And he came to an epiphany in his life. And he writes in his journal, No man is a fool to give up that which he cannot keep, to gain which he will never lose. And the Christians around him really thought he was a fool. Here was a bright, intelligent mind out of a, well, when they were doing really good back then in Wheaton Bible College. And, and, and he, he, all this guy wanted to do was be a missionary. And the unfortunate thing at that time is, well, to be a missionary to do these things, you've got to go to school, you've got to get your theology, you've got to get your doctorate, you've got to get all these things like that. And he'd gone through close to eight years of schooling just so he can, and he had a heart for the Akua Indians in Ecuador. And just, a content, just that's all where he wanted to be. And finally, when they were offering him, you've been in school long enough, now we want you to be a teacher and be a professor. You've got all these things. He's like, no, I'm called to go to Ecuador. You told me I had to go through this and go through that and go through all these things. I just want to go tell them about Jesus. They don't care if I know the Greek or the Hebrews or that. Do I know Jesus? His first missionary endeavor. Some of you know the story. Great success. A spear was put through his body with one of the gospel tracts. They thought they were demons of some sort when he finally met up with the Akua Indians and him and three others. You might have seen the video of the movie The Tip of the Spear and Splendor of Glory and all these things. And The very man who killed Jim Elliot became a Christian. Because Elizabeth Elliot. Now this is a guy all the schooling. And people said, what a waste. What a tragic waste that he would go ruin and waste his life down there. And then the comfort. Then the comfort. You see? See what happens? He goes there and he dies. We could have used him in our schools to, to do what? I mean, you, you're putting guys in school so they can go through these schools so they can go back to more school and go to more school so they can teach others in more school. Who's actually going to go out to the mission field? And that was the organization he was with. And you got to get all your degrees. you got to get all this stuff. And, and the things that were said, what a waste, what a waste. And then a year later, Elizabeth Elliot goes back with her then, now her daughter. And she's going to continue on the work there in Ecuador. And actually travels into the deepest part of the jungle and meets the tribe that killed her husband and the three others with Missionary Aviation Fellowship. Ten years later, the very man who killed Jim Elliot baptized Jim Elliot's daughter. Became pastor. He's doing all these things. What a waste. You see, that's why I can look in context, and that's why that quote has a great meaning to me. No man is a fool to give up that which he cannot keep, to gain that which he can never lose. That's why I have tattooed on me Galatians 6, 14. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified to me and I to the world. Not all the verses, just the verse reference. And so here, it's not by the fruit of your own hands. It's not fruit for myself. But it's to be in, it's spent in the lives of others. And, and again, the judgment's going to happen. All these things are going to happen. And that very thing that you're holding on to is going to be carried away by the King Jerob of Assyria. Uh, verse 7 of chapter 10. As for Samaria, her king is cut off. Uh, her king is cut off like a twig on the water. Also the high places of Avon, the sin of Israel, shall be destroyed. The throne, uh, the thorn and the thistle shall grow on their altars. They shall uh, say to the mountains, cover us. And to the hills fall on us. We also see that cross reference in Revelation. 
where they're just despairing of themselves and they're wishing that, the, that they could die and they can't because they're just going to continue to be tormented and if the rocks could fall upon us. Verse 9 of chapter 10. O Israel, you have sinned from the days of Gibeah. Remember that? You, you've intermingled. You begin to do all those compromises and, and you've done this. Look, this is, no, this is no new news. There they stood, the battle at Gibeah against the children of iniquity did not overtake them. Where... Or when is it my desire, I will chasten them. When it is my desire, I will chasten them. People shall be gathered against them when I bind them uh, for their uh, two transgressions. Ephraim is a trained heifer that loves to thresh grain, but I, I, uh, but I harnessed her fair neck. I will make Ephraim pull a plow, and Judah uh, shall plow. Jacob shall break his clods. Understand the, the, the terminology that's going on here. The, the ox loves threshing. When you're threshing out the grain, the, the, the ox, the heifers, they, they can just, they, they're free. They're unrestricted. They're just pulling something and, they, and they're very free. But when you're plowing, you're harnessed with a yoke and you've got to stay in a straight row. And if you're not, then the, you know, the, the taskmaster is whipping you. And he says, that's what you're going to be like. You too, Judah, by the way, a hundred years later. You're not learning from the Assyrians, as he's telling him here. Hosea is prophesying also to Judah. But understand this. You, you again, you're like this trained heifer. You're just going to have to plow. That's, that's what you're going to be restricted to. You know, God's in a redemption. God's in a redemption. He redeems people. But sometimes, because of the consequences of your sin, you might never, ever be able to go and do some other ministry. Like uh, prison ministry. Um, some of the stuff that we get to do, well, you have to be free and clear over five years from past offenses. Uh, no paper, no parole, no nothing, and then you have to have a great track record. There's other things that you just might be inhibited. You might, you're, not, uh, you're not okayed for certain jobs because of certain things on your, on your past life. Okay, God forgives and He redeems. But understand this, that by the certain actions and certain things in your life, you're going to be restricted. You're going to be harnessed, and that's going to be your thing, and, you, and you're going to have to. That's sometimes where Christians, oh, I don't understand, man. I go, look, because of all the sin, because of the things, because of the consequences here in this life and this earth, you just get to plow that row. That's all you get to do. And be happy about it, that you, at least you get to plow that row. You know, as Christians right now, the warning to you is like, you get to threat. We get to do a lot of things as Christians. But if you use your liberality, if you use your liberty as a cloak and a covering for sin, well, then you're, going to get, you're just going to get restricted. I, there's, there's guys who are go serve the rest of their lives in prison. God's forgiven. They're redeemed. I know of one guy who just decided to backslide, just frustrated, just frustrated. And he just decided to go out and just drink. He just had a couple of drinks. And it, it, he was able to drive. But he pulls out onto a street. Now, a car that was going the wrong way was clearly going the wrong way on the one-way street. The guy who had a couple of drinks in him was going the right way. But the other guy coming was just coming back from an ice cream shop with his daughter and his daughter's friend, teenagers, and they have a head-on collision. And the two girls die. The dad lives. The Christian who decided to just, I'm going to go get me a couple of drinks is doing two 25-year life sentences. Not, not consecutive. Concur not concurrent, but consecutive. When he finishes his first 25 years, he's got to do the other 25. That's some stiff penalties in the state of Arizona. That's how they, but, well, wait a minute. He was going the right way, but the problem was he shouldn't have been out there drinking. The reality is, and they say in Arizona, is if he would have been drinking, he would have had better response time, and he could have been able to avoid that person who was illegally driving who was sober. That's just the way it works. Wines and complains all you want. I'm like, you know what? You're in prison. You're just not going to get out. Serve the Lord right there. You're never going to be married. You're never going to have kids. You're not going to have grandkids. You're not going to do any of those things. You are now harnessed. And that is your plow. That is your row. And that's what you get to do. Would that be any here? Well, there's people that have, who've come through Calvary Chapel, St. Paul, that get to plow one row. And they won't even do that because they're mad because they don't get to thresh anymore. But you have your freedom in your threshing right now. I know of a pastor who, at that same time, 
at that same time, just got frustrated with ministry, got frustrated. His wife had a broken leg. He was going to school. He was doing all this kind of stuff. Just a lot of, lot of stress in his life. And he's about 100 miles away from home, and he just decides to just go in and just get a beer from the supermarket and drinks his beer. And just, that was his rebellion. He hasn't drank any years. Just, that's it. And then he goes, to, he's 100 miles away from home, and he goes to throw the beer can away, and he goes, hey, brother! And it's a fellow pastor who's 200 miles away from home. Oh, uh, And he doesn't throw it away. He just keeps it. And, what are you doing? Oh, i got to go get me some Tic Tacs. i got to get this. I need diapers. I need diapers. Your kids are gone. What are you? And he's just grabbing stuff to try to, to keep away from the, the smell of the alcohol. Just had one beer. Two guys. Same exact time in life. One drives down the road, he's doing 50 years. The other one still gets to thresh, still gets to do the things. And just where God is in your life. You have that warning here. He says here, Ephraim was a trained heifer, verse 11. Ephraim is a trained heifer that loves to thresh grain, but I harnessed her, uh, her fair neck. I will make Ephraim pull a plow. Judah shall plow, Jacob shall break her clods. So, look at verse 12. So for yourselves righteousness, reap mercy. Break up the fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till He comes and rains righteousness on you. Here's a glimmer of hope. There's this judgment. You don't have to be harnessed. You don't have to be stuck on that one row. You can be threshing. You can be doing these things. You don't have to be trained and plowing that one thing. You can do, and now is. What do you can cross-reference that with in Corinthians? It talks about now is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable year, Lord. Now is the time of God's favor. When? Now. Right now. And you don't have to wait. You don't have to put it off. You don't have to do any of those things. He says, but, but sow for yourselves righteousness. Now we know Psalm 22.8, 2 Corinthians 9.6, and Galatians 6.8. Whatever you sow, that you're going to reap. Galatians 6.8, if you sow to the flesh, what are you going to reap? The things of the flesh. You sow to the Spirit, you're going to reap the things of the Spirit. You put into that garbage in, garbage out. It tells us here in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 that, you know, about giving liberally and giving hilariously and giving cheerfully and just, again, it's all others centered. You, you catch the thing what's going on here? I don't think, well, not in this church. I've heard it some other places. But you're never going to come to church and say, you know what, folks? You folks share way too much. You're too loving. You're too giving. You're too thoughtful. Pull back. You're spoiling the people around you. You're spoiling the fruit. No. You see, we come to church to get equipped to do the work of the ministry. Why? Because we're all vomitous, carnal flesh bags of pus. Sinners saved by the grace of God. Saints of God. Sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we come and we're like, yeah, that's right. Maybe I didn't do it, Pastor Chick said. He gave some pretty good advice here. This is things that I've been following. I got this 28 years ago. 28 years ago, these 11 points on biblical decision-making. And it permeates my whole life. And when I disobey, the consequences, which you'll be hearing for quite some time because I have three broken ribs and it's going to take about six months. So just get used to those stories right now. I'm telling you. Because of being in disobedience and being in that place, the consequences are much greater. This is why when people say, well, I'll pray for you to be healed. I know me. It'll probably just encourage more bad behavior. So I think that's why I'm not getting healed. And so here's the thing, folks, is that, again, that if you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap the things of the flesh. I'm all for it. We'll pray for it tonight. And I'll pray for it tonight to be healed in the afterglow. But understand this. If you sow to the Spirit, you'll reap the things of the Spirit. Look what he says here. You have plowed wickedness. Look, here's a great verse, verse 12, about repentance and sowing to righteousness. But look at the indictment here. You have plowed wickedness. You have reaped iniquity. You have eaten the fruit of lies because you trusted in your own way. Remember back in verse 2, chapter 10? Because of a, di a divided heart. Jesus tells, you, tells us you cannot serve two masters. You'll either love the one and hate the other, be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. 
It is just impossible for you and I. There is no way that you can concentrate on your flesh and try to bless other people. It's one or the other. If something has to be sacrificed, I'm just making a suggestion here. Sacrifice your own feelings. Sacrifice your own problems. Sacrifice and just give those up. Is it really a sacrifice? And focus and put your lives and invest in others. You know what you can do? For those of you who are married, you might be sitting right next to the person that you can devote your life to and make their lives better. If you're not married, well, don't think that you can start getting hooked up with a brother or sister and devoting your life to them and kind of win them over that way. But, but uh, here's the thing. Work in construction. I've been reading the Bible for almost 29 years now. and Coming upon verses like this and about serving others. I'll just give you application in my life. Now, again, you can take it. I mean, it tells us in God's Word to look at your spiritual leaders, imitate their lives, and do those things. How could I bless the guy that I was working with, a partnered up? At the end of the day in construction, one of the loneliest and longest jobs is, is rolling up these power cords that are thick 10-gauge wire, and they're 150 feet long, and wrapping those up and rigging stuff like that. And usually at the end of the day, you're just tired, and you just want to get over there. I would go up and roll up all my cords, and then I'd roll up my partner's cords. I did that for six months before he even acknowledged it. Just, he didn't even want to acknowledge it. He was just, I know I could tell he was thankful. I didn't go, and I would just, I would do everything I can because I'm tired at the end of the day too, and so I'd just go out and I'd roll up my cords, put all my tools away in the back of the truck tool bed, and I would go roll up his cords, and as he came out of the porta potty, we're ready to go. We don't have to spend more time doing that. And, and I'm talking the cords that are going through mud and the muck and the mire of the day, and and all the and, and cleaning them and doing those things, and I would make first, and then it just got to the point where I would just roll up his cords first. That way, if he ever came out, he wouldn't be rolling up my cords. Or that's an application of scripture. I'm going to invest my life in a guy that that I I, I want to share Christ with, and, and I want to do these things with, and that that's something you can do. You can do it with a coworker. You you can. How am I going to make the life better for those around me? How is it when it comes time for laying off? that they actually struggle letting me go. It just comes down to we don't want to or seniority, that they, they actually just go, oh, we just don't want to let this guy go or something like that. Instead of going, oh, woo-hoo, bye-bye. That, that, that this is the thing, that this, this, this person just makes life better for everyone else around them. That's the desire. He tells us here, because you trusted in your own way in the multitude of your mighty men. Therefore, tumult shall arise among your people, and your fortresses shall be plundered, as Shalaman plundered Beth Arbel in the city uh, in the day of battle. A mother dashes in pieces upon her children. Thus it shall be done to you, O Bethel, because of your great wickedness at the dawn, the king of Israel shall be cut off. Hey, this is Hosea. And I, I love you all here, folks, but I, I don't even know if I'm... I, I, well, I doubt very seriously I'm teaching with the intensity that even Hosea was saying in his day. But there is great warning here. Great warning. I have a prayer meeting that I meet with some uh, other similar like-minded people, uh, other pastors who really want to see St. Paul one for Christ. And uh, I just got caught up with the business of the ministry yesterday, pounding down the coffee. And I finally fell asleep about 5.30 in the morning. And prayer was at 9.30, but I needed to get up at 8.30 to shave and shower and all of a sudden get ready. And so I, and I totally missed it. And I just, I just texted the guy and said, man, I blew it. I really look forward to the third Thursday of the month and, and praying with this guy. That's the only time we really get to be with each other. And we're just praying for the lives of the, the city of St. Paul and just winning people. And he's been, man, he's been here a lot longer than I am. And, and he's been here like, you know, 35 years. He's been here, you know, uh, 19 years. And just, just praying for people to come. Just this great revival. And, and I missed out. And I just said, man, I blew it. And I'm sorry. Could you, and I, I'll be at the coffee house all day. Could you, could you just please stop by? Just please, please, please pray, pray with me. I just... I missed that. I blew it. I'm sorry. And he, and he did. And uh, I, you understand, I can, get caught up with the, I can get caught up with the business of the ministry. And I, and I can, myself, and especially, I can get so caught up with the fruit for myself and do all these other things. And yet, but I could look at verse 12. And as I'm studying Hosea chapters 9 and 10, I'm just like, oh, man, this is for me. And then you know what, folks? There's a bazillion things you haven't even heard of because it was just for me. But what you're getting here today is I'm sharing from my own life, that we can get caught up with just our own hands and our own works and our own thoughts. And, and yet, we just got to pray. 
And we just got to just readjust. Recomputing, recalculating. We just got to get those things and get those right. And I just, I just needed to be right and to, and to pray with this guy. And my, my day got right. My day got right later in that afternoon, but it got right. And, and, and here's the thing. Show, sow for yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy. Break up that fallow ground where it's time to seek the Lord till He comes and rains righteousness upon us. What's that fallow ground in your heart today, in your life today? For me, I just got cut up yesterday with business and ministry. That's, that's fallow ground. I got to get that plowed up. But there's something each and every one of our lives here. It could be and don't let it get that way. If it gets that way, and maybe you're here today and you've got to, you just, you just, you just foul. Just foul. Break it up. Maybe you're not, maybe this is for a later message or whatever, but understand this we need to invest our lives in the lives of others. That's how our problems go away. I just don't create any, I don't get any more in debt. No more in debt to myself. And I just invest my lives in others. And, you know, I just, I just don't need to be bothered with that stuff anymore. And so not to be a busybody and get caught up in other people's drama and stuff. But I'm giving you 29 years of experience. I've been doing these 11 things. And when I don't, I'll crack a ribbon there. All right? I like ribs, but not like this.